Ministry is no easy task. It may be simple enough if all you do is point fingers at others and consider yourself the darling of the remnant. But if you were to live the prophet's life, oftentimes that means calling out the sin within your family. We don't often do that because we are immediately quoted the speck and log verse. But sometimes it is the church, or rather the chosen, that are as far from truth as any non-believer. Our lust to live in the past often demands a prophet to walk in and lament for God's chosen. A prophet who is lovingly called to stand witness and call others out of the stagnation of our past. Welcome to Sabbath School U, and welcome to my team here today. Thanks for being here. Um, how about let's introduce ourselves. Let's start from over here. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Heather Lunsford. Okay. Hi, my name's Richard Martin. Hello, I'm Anastasia Kananayako. All right, welcome you all, and welcome to those who are watching us today. Just real quick, have you been to a place that you just so love? Not something you've seen, okay, but been to a place that you thought, I'd want to live here. Oh, of course. Yeah? Where's that? Hawaii for me. Hawaii. Yep. Okay. <laughs> it's right. easy. It's my favorite place in the world. It's a little island off the eastern coast of the United States called Bermuda. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I've yet to experience such a place. <laughs> you have yet to experience a place? Have I you traveled? I don't think I've been anywhere. I mean, I've been in Virginia and Maryland, and I don't know there are any of them are places I want to stay in. Hey, there are good places within the Virginia and Maryland area. This is why I love Maryland. Um, again, our, our welcome to everybody. Our theme for today is more woes for the prophet for our lesson. And we will start with a text um, and then a prayer. And I've asked Heather if you could do that for us today. Fabulous. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and read from Jeremiah 20, verse 7. O oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I, and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Let's bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have gathered here today to study your word. Please be with us in everything that um, transpires here, and please bring your Holy Spirit into this place. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. So, more woes for the prophet. When you hear woes, what comes to mind? Sadness. Sadness? Distress. Distress. Just something that you need to stop at and don't go any further type of Okay. Thing. All right. Kind of like a warning? Yeah. Okay. Now, do woes only come to certain people or is there anybody exempted when it comes to woes? I don't think so. You don't think so? You don't think that it only applies to Jeremiah's time? You think it applies to us today too? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's sin creeping at the door all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a time when you want to do something, but you know you shouldn't, and then something in the back of your head is like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes, great. <laughs> so we pretty much all agree that woes or struggles happen to everybody, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think what's more challenging for us is that it does not ask permission or give us a heads up wow. mm -hmm. when it comes, right? Definitely. And I think that the lesson talks about how do we hold steady yes. mm -hmm. during struggles? Mm -hmm. how, how do we hold firm? How, how do we sustain in the midst of woes and struggles? Mm -hmm. Because we're called to the ministry. Yes. I don't think only pastors or you know, uh, key leaders or deacons and elders... Um, are the ones who are called to ministry. All of us are called to the ministry. Mm -hmm. And this lesson points out that when you're called to the ministry, there's a certain sure thing that happens, and that is struggles. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's get to that. By, um, let, let's start with Jeremiah 23, 14, 15. If we can go to that. Um, 
Jeremiah 23, 14, 15. Somebody, somebody can read that if you already have it. All right, I've got it. Jeremiah 23, verses 14 and 15. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water, because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. Any comment on that verse? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so, so here's my observation. In leadership roles, a lot of people go for it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like um, we know it also as um, uh, the corporate ladder. Sure. Right? Anytime mm -hmm. there's an organization, the, there are some, I'm not saying all, mm -hmm. who would do extra stuff to get into the radar so that when that next opening is available up, or even skip a few and go straightly to the top, they get picked mm -hmm. or, or, or they, they're they part of those that will be picked. Mm -hmm. uh, there are leaders like that. Mm -hmm. There are also leaders who don't want to be leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think Jeremiah is one of them, <laughs> Yes. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he was called even before he was formed in his mother's womb, but, right. but he's like, no, please, not me. You know, I, I don't want that at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and when we study scripture, it is always good to take it into the personal context we mm -hmm. live in today. Mm -hmm. So after establishing those, um, there's probably more than two kinds of groups of right. leaders, ones that really just mm -hmm. want to get up there and ones mm -hmm. who don't want to be but are called. Right. Um, there are struggles that go along with us. How do we navigate around leaders mm -hmm. of either side, of, of either kind? Uh, what do we do in those situations? Do we pray for them and, you know, hope that it goes well? Or do we take part? Because the text that we just read was the kind of leader who was calling it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we Try doing to... that, you know, <laughs> to even your family or your this friends. This is kind of one of the things that I think Jeremiah was most afraid of, that responsibility, that prophetic responsibility to... Uh, call sin by its right name and speak truth to power. And when leaders are called to that kind of ministry, I think it is our responsibility to pray for them. And it's not an arbitrary responsibility. I think it's a Christian responsibility mm -hmm. to buoy them on the wings of prayer mm -hmm. um, because this is something that I don't think is natural to mm -hmm. just go to someone and be like, um, Heather, <laughs> You're not in God's will. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, I mean, who does that? Yeah. Right, right. It's difficult. So and prayer. Yet that's what we're called to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think prophetic ministry is limited to, like you mentioned, pastors. I think uh, part of the right. Christian experience, there's a prophetic element to it mm -hmm. where um, there are times where the Lord wants us to call things out. Mm -hmm. um, and he will give us mm -hmm. ways to say that. And mm -hmm. throughout scripture, there are examples where it kind of seemed like the tone was softer. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it was a little bit more abrasive. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it escalated. You know, I think of Moses and Aaron and their interaction with Pharaoh. It went from kind of like 10 to 100 real fast. First it was like, listen, my people, uh, let's, can, can we have them? And then it was like, all right. <laughs> you know, um, so, yeah. Yeah, to add to that, um, I feel like we shouldn't just be praying for the people in leadership that are in these roles, that God appointed them to be in these roles, we know that it's hard for them. But what's hardest is trying to reach the people that think they are in the right. Ooh. Mercy. That feel like there's nothing wrong with what they do or Watch what they out. believe. And therefore, when God's word comes to them in a convicting manner like this, um, they are hating on, on it. And they yes. feel like it's not from the Lord because there's nothing I can be doing wrong right now if I'm walking with God. And um, I feel like, you know, people here, when we read Jeremiah, that's how they felt. They felt mm -hmm. there was nothing wrong with what, what they believed. They felt like they're already godly and righteous. And, um, and that brings me back to think about, um, you know, the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. Yes. Um, they thought it was better for them to be back in Egypt and being slaves yes. than being out there and following what God was saying to them because what God was telling them to do was inconveniencing them. Yes. Right. So they thought it was better to be back 
you know, they, they even cried out to the Lord. It was better when we were back in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> a question comes to mind from your comments, and I just want to raise it for us. Um, is it possible to become so comfortable in leadership positions that you can't be convinced that you're wrong? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sometimes you create your comfortable spot in that leadership. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Because you're a leader, you can make decisions. Sure. You have you, your decisions have weight in certain areas, you know, sure. of a group or a team of decision making. Mm -hmm. And because you you plot it out mm -hmm. to get to a point where you're so comfortable, mm -hmm. once it gets there, you, all your focus now is not of the mission but to keep that comfortable spot. And, and you try to draw in anything that would make it sound like you're, yeah. you know. Supporters, you remove those. Yeah. Threats. Yeah. Right. Oh. yeah. And, and what happens is when struggles and challenges comes, mm -hmm. when the woes come in, mm -hmm. it becomes about you. Mm -hmm. That's when you can tell that comfortable spot has been created. Yes. I think, anyway. I mean, many times, that we find leaders who, who get in trouble is when the focus moves away from glorifying God to glorifying me. Sure. So I think it's possible. It's definitely possible. I have a personal experience of, you know, how you can become comfortable. And okay. uh, this wasn't yesterday. I think I was in third grade. <laughs> <laughs> and in my school, they had line leaders when you go from the mm -hmm. class to the bathroom. Yep, yep. And uh, that was like, a coveted position. You're a line leader for the day. It's probably all of like 10 minutes, but it was great. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm going and the teacher entrusted you with this position. And so you lead the um, guys to the bathroom and two would go in at a time. Another one couldn't go in until someone else came out. And you weren't supposed to like just hang on the poles and you stay in line. And so I'm in this position and I'm just so deceived, right? So I'm hanging on this pole, like swinging around, just glad to be, you know, the line leader. And then another guy who's not the leader is hanging on the pole. So while I'm swinging from the pole, I'm saying, hey, man, get off that pole, like stand in line. And he says to me, he's like, well, you're on the pole. And I honestly did not know that I was on the pole. I was so comfortable in that mm -hmm. position that I was comfortable meeting out instructions and giving directives. But then it wasn't until someone pointed out that, hey, you're doing the same thing, that it was like, right. whoa, yeah. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that third grade little illustration of my life has really carried over to say, hey, man, when you're entrusted with a leadership position, um, the leadership position cannot be expressed only in words because anybody can tell other people the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But people are going to be looking at what you're doing more than what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Which comes to the next question, you know, from looking out for, you know, from those leaders. Let, let's now put ourselves in the shoes of the leaders, mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. who are called for the mission. Sure. Mm -hmm. When we're aware of the struggles that may come along with that role, mm -hmm. responsibility, when we're aware of the challenges that would come along mm -hmm. with that role, would you still be like, yeah, count me in? I think it takes a special person to be, yes. to be a leader. It definitely does. I mean, there's sometimes I've been asked to do like a, a little Sabbath school or a little, you know, little kids, you know, and since teaching, okay, you know, I can do it because they're little and I'm used to little, you know, little ones and so I can do it. But you don't really understand the magnitude that you've just, you know, you've agreed to be a leader. And I think God knows where to put certain people in your life to kind of lead you to be a leader. Because at some point, you know, you don't really realize that you're you're leading. Like somebody was like, oh, go do the little Sabbath school. You're, you're good with kids. Okay. And then you don't even realize that, oh, I'm a leader now, yes. <laughs> like, oh, okay, you know, and then all of a sudden you have this responsibility and you don't really understand how you got there and, oh. Mm -hmm. And I, you don't know what to do. Right. You know, nobody's mentoring you. Exactly. But then you realize that this is actually your calling. Right. Wow. And you didn't even know it, you know. And it becomes frustrating sometimes because it's now overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Being called to the mission, to the work of God, comes with struggles because we live in a world of sin, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. when, when, we, when we follow God's paths, it seems like it's against the tide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? So there's a struggle there. Right. Uh, how, how are we going to face that if it was us or if it was somebody that we know? How can we be an encouragement to those leaders? Because, I mean, the story of Jeremiah is, mm -hmm. is, is fascinating oh, because yeah. of 
how he just continues to sustain, mm -hmm. even when he says it, I, I, I'm done. Yeah, yes. This is just, I can't right. do this. And yet he's there. Right. He's doing, he's facing these great leaders mm -hmm. and he sustains. Mm -hmm. Right. How can we sustain when we're in those positions or how can we help those who are in those positions sustain? I think Jeremiah is a good example of true humanity because I actually struggle or have struggled with leadership and being entrusted with leadership. And I actually, reading last night over text, that he struggled. And I appreciated that he said, who am I? Who am I to do this? I, I am... Am I, how, why did God call me? Like, right. I don't get it. Like, you know, this is, you know, he almost was saying, this is ridiculous. And why was I even born? And yeah, I've definitely felt that way. And I think that was given specifically to us in scripture because of what you're asking. Because we go through that. We go through that moment of, I, I don't know why I'm doing this. And I don't know why the Lord called me. And I, I don't, I don't get it. And why am I here? And we second guess ourselves. It's hum human to do that. Mm -hmm. And to see somebody who was a prophet and who had this calling and this message to tell from God to go through the same thing that, you know, we could be feeling, it's encouraging. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird to say that it's encouraging when somebody's going through something, you know, right. but it's so human. It's so raw and so... That's, you know, sure. oh. I, I guess the encouragement comes in when you realize that it's not all about you. Right. And that even through this struggles, in the end, you end up a better person mm -hmm. and that God is always with you type of thing. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, um, and, and in those challenges, I mean, we even have politicians who profess the knowledge of God. Definitely. Right. I mean, they they speak it and they but yet there's they seem to be against the programs that help the orphans, the widows, and those in need. Right. And that's real today. Yes. How do we deal with that? I think there's something soothing to the ear um, when you mention godly things. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. man, I'm so thankful to God that I made it here safely. We had a little turbulence in the air. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I thank you all for your prayers and support of the campaign. Um, it's, it's easy to the ears, it's palatable. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, you know, this is comfortable. Um, because if anyone were to just share their true intentions, that may pose mm -hmm. the risk of showing people off. You know, give me all your money. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. It's exactly. like running away. <laughs> yeah. But when you package it, it's like, okay, cool. But um, like you mentioned, why then isn't there an alignment with programs that help those who are helpless mm -hmm. and provide hope to those who are hopeless? Mm -hmm. um, and I think therein lies kind of the answer is that I know how to speak and sound well mm -hmm. or sound interested to gain attention and sympathy. But when it comes to making the decisions to actually help those, um, I don't really have to because it's not it's a two-way street. It's not just that there are leaders who can sound like it but not really support it. But then I think that many of us are too easily persuaded by the sound and not demanders of the substance. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh. I'm satisfied that you sound like you believe it. Mm -hmm. I don't look beyond that, you know what I mean? To say, well, are you really lining up? Is there a connection between profession and practice? Mm -hmm. And so it's a two-way street. I, I won't put it all on the politicians and what they say, mm -hmm. but we also have to take responsibility and be accountable to say, man, I'm letting him get away with that. Mm -hmm. I'm letting him get, get away with kind of just blowing the horn mm -hmm. and, and then not following up to see, did you actually do what you said you were going to do? Um, yeah. And before that, we can even get to a point where by their fruits, by their yes. lifestyle, yes. does it really speak or coincide with what they're saying? Sure. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think that's I feel like important. it's also a level of conviction for the person that is in that leadership role. Because if we look at you know, politicians these days, I don't know how many of them are actually really convicted of what they're promising versus mm -hmm. like Jeremiah. You know, he was, he didn't want to be in the position that he's in, but he was, and he knew that, I mean, I'm sure there was times that he wanted to give up and turn around and be like, why do I need this? I have, I, I am gaining nothing from this, but right. there's a conviction deep inside of him and even says that there is a fire in his, in yeah. his bones fire from within, yeah. where, 
you know, he could feel the conviction of what the Lord was calling him to do. And he not only had to speak the words, but he also had to live those words, which James calls us to do. It, it tells us not to only be listeners, but to also be doers. doers. Yeah. And I think that's where in today's world, in today's life, you know, around us, we don't see enough of that. We don't see enough of listeners being doers. Wow. You know, it's mm. all about, you know, kind of this deceitfulness, you know, making these promises, but not actually you know, fulfilling them. It's more about, it's more about the project, projection than the, the project. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Jeremiah 18, 1 to 10 real quick. Okay. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 10. And if somebody has that already, if they can read it for us. Okay, I can read it. Um, okay. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and, I, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he had made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seems good to the potter, to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, how can I not how can I not do with you as this potter? says the Lord, look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If the nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to replant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which, with which I said I would benefit it. How is this relevant for us today? What is the prophetic principle or interpretation that we find here that can be an encouragement for us um, even today? I've always been captivated by this image. Um, yeah. the potter at the potter's wheel. And one of the principles that I draw from it is that um, in everyday life, you can draw spiritual application and lessons um, for leadership. Mm -hmm. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah not by something that he couldn't understand. He just said, hey man, make a left on Main Street and go to the old potter's house. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, while you're peering through, I'm gonna teach you some lessons from it. And so in our attempts to speak um, truth to power, as it were, or, or speak encouragement to one another, um, we can always be open to object lessons that are right around us, mm -hmm. utilizing things that we're familiar with. I mean, mm -hmm. iPads, cell phones, mm -hmm. sports. There are so many ways to build bridges from things that people will pass every day. Like, I'm sure that in context, people pass this potter's house mm -hmm. a lot. Right. And so the message that Jeremiah would now bring was not only going to be on this particular day when he shared it, but also anytime someone passed the house, it's like, man, I remember what Jeremiah said. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a prophetic principle for me that in our um, prophetic living, we can build bridges using everyday things. I mean, Jesus did it best. These are where he drew right. his parables from. He said, hey, look at the flower. It's like, okay. Right. Oh, <laughs> wow, I've never looked, looked at, at the flower, flower like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and now you see it. So yeah, right. that's one principle. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anybody else on that? Uh, what I like about... Uh, Again, this image of, uh, about um, in the potter's hand yes. mm -hmm. is that from nothing you can be so good. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. An envy, mm -hmm. the beauty, mm -hmm. but you got to be willing. Yes. Right. You know, when, when, when you're called to be part of God's mm -hmm. worker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you've got to be willing. Mm -hmm. Struggles are going to come. You have to have that burning passion, mm -hmm. you know, in your heart to continue mm -hmm. no matter what's happening, to keep going. Right. You know, um, there will be so many things that happen in our life that would make us think, you know, this is not for me. Right. Yes. I don't think this is God's call. And sometimes it's because you're about to be taken out of that comfort zone you mm -hmm. were talking right. about earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. But... Being God's called servant has a lot of blessings. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them we won't even experience here on earth. Mm -hmm. I think we have to keep that in mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the context of the pleasure here on earth is mm -hmm. temporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The context of the blessing as God's people is in heaven. Right. And that's forever. You know, we forget that when we encounter our really passionate brethren. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
you know, who just reminds you of your faults. Mm -hmm. Yes. And really just brings you down beyond the humbleness mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. And you're like, somebody's got to show this person. <laughs> right? Now, anybody has their last thoughts on being called by God and serving Him? Well, I actually have a personal testimony of, um, you know, becoming Adventist, con that conversion experience. You know, I've only been Adventist for three years, and it's been, you know, good and bad. Mm -hmm. the, the bad part of it was in the beginning of my conversion experience, it was very difficult for me to keep going because I'm the only Adventist in my family. And when I started changing the way I perceive wow. the world, the way I perceive God, I started, you know, following the health laws, not eating, giving up certain types of meats, um, you know, keeping the what Sabbath. Was that like? um, well, I can tell you every dinner was excruciating. Wow. It was a, wow. they basically devoured me with trying to tell me that Jesus ate meat, that, you know, sure. um, about just, it was just pulverizing. Whoa. It was very, very bad. I mean, there was times that I even skipped family gatherings just for that purpose wow. because it turned, I mean, I'm out of, I'm one out of nine. So, wow. you know, it was more like the attention was about, oh, what is Anastasia going to eat today? What is she not going to eat today? Oh, let's, let's uh, tell her what Jesus did and that we're supposed to, you know, believe. And if we believe that God heals and that God cleanses, then he will cleanse whatever we have in front of us before it goes into our body. It was just very, very bad and very sad that my family didn't really accept what I was doing. They actually felt I was going in the wrong direction. Mm. But there was a time, you know, when, when I started changing into keeping the Sabbath and giving up going to church on Sunday, and God opened up all sorts of doors for me to know that wow. Sabbath was the place, the day that I was supposed to keep. But my family's rejection towards me, and, you know, it was hard not to watch TV with them. It was hard to do something different because they were doing something together and I had to be different. I had to be set apart from them. There was a point in my life where I'm just like, it was so much better when I didn't have this. Right. When right. I was, when I knew Jesus just for his grace and mercy and when I didn't know these, the laws, when I didn't know the Sabbath, it was so much easier for me. But I, I stood grounded because I knew that, you know, there's something better that's going to come out of this. Something was pushing me forward, and that was knowing that God will deliver me where Amen. I need to go. Do you feel like you're called to minister to your family? I felt now like I was called. So many other people. Most definitely. In the beginning, they were not accepting of this. And that's great because many times we don't even realize what God is doing in our life. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the situation, and then we look back and like, wow, that I didn't know what God was doing, but mm -hmm. now He's called me to lead my family. I mean, mm -hmm. praise God for the experience that you've had. And, and, and I just want to thank everybody for being here today and sharing your thoughts. And I pray that God would continue to bless you, especially you in the ministry that you've been called. And to many of those who are ministering to other people, if you would like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www.sabbathschool the letter U, dot org. Remember, the goal of Bible study is information and transformation. It's for the head and the heart. For Sabbath School U, I'm Mark Siege.